So we talked a lot about the importance of the structures in your pelvis, but there's also an important structure a little higher up, and those are your breasts. And that's the topic of today's video. Breasts are incredibly important. That's what separates us mammals from other species. That's why they're called mammary glands. When you're an embryo, your skin, you start to form this ridge, kind of like, kind of like this. I wonder if you can see it, where the epidermis kind of raises up, and that goes from your ex, from your groin area all the way to your axilla, and another on the other side. This epidermis ridge. So let's just draw it out. You start to form this ridge of skin, and that we call the milk line. And this ridge is kind of our foundation, and breast buds can form anywhere along the ridge depending on the species. So some species have a ton of breast and nipples all up and down their ventral surface. We form it right at the breast area, right at the chest area, okay? However, if things can go wrong, you can form extra nipples anywhere along the milk line. We call those supernumerary nipples, um, kind of casually just called third nipples or fourth nipples. So no, that can happen. Very common, usually not a problem, just kind of an aesthetic thing. That is how they form. But what is their function? Breast or mammary glands make milk to feed the infant. How do they make milk? Well, they're made up of things called lobules, which produce the milk, made up of ducts, which drain the milk, drain milk, and then just some connective tissue, some stroma <clears throat> to support the whole thing. And if you take a cross section of the breast, it as a nipple. Then you have all these lobules. That produce the milk and then they drain into the ducts, which collect the milk and ultimately feed the infant. If we take a little closer look, down to the cellular layer, we can see that there are two main cell layers that we need to know. The first is going to be your luminal cells. And these are columnar cells. Try to draw them as columnar as possible. Columnar cells. And these are the things that actually make the milk. And then right beneath the luminal cells, you have myo epithelial cells. And the purpose of these cells is they eject the milk. That is the basis of the breast. You have the luminal cells making the milk, the mild epithelial cells ejecting it through the ducts out the nipple. Okay? Important thing to know, women obviously have more breasts than men, but men do have breasts, just very little. Women, have most of their breast tissue on the upper, outer quadrant. So right here by your shoulder, I guess by your axilla. Men on the other hand, have it right by their areolar. So right under or around the nipple. And so if you have abnormal breast tissue in men, that's the first place you'd palpate, look for it, okay? If you have abnormal breast tissue in women, you just play the odds and it'll probably be in the upper outer quadrant because that's where the most that's where most of the breast tissue is. Important fact that you need to know. Another important fact is that breasts are hormone hormone sensitive. So the first sign of puberty is actually the formation of your breast buds. Very important you know that happens before menarche. And then after menarche, then they can grow and shrink depending on exposure to hormones. So you can have cyclic breast tenderness. Sometimes it could just be pain. So I'll just write cyclic breast pain. And then other hormones that control are things like prolactin that causes more 
more uh, milk production, etc. So just know that breasts are very hormone sensitive. I think that's a good rundown of just regular breast anatomy. Let's look at some pathology. Just because your breasts are incredibly specialized doesn't mean they're immune to, I guess, the, the natural pathology of other tissues such as trauma or inflammation. Trauma or inflammation. So let's just talk about trauma first. Uh, because of the high fat content of your breast, if there's uh, any traumatic event to your breast, you can have fat necrosis. This could be as simple as you know jogging or exercising without wearing a supportive bra. It could be running into something. So however, note that a lot of women might not even notice it. And you only notice it because that fat necrosis can become calcified. So you feel this little lump, and that lump is usually painless. So it's a painless lump. And it can be quite scary because you're not sure what it is, if, especially if you don't remember any history of trauma. You just feel that kind of lump. And what's even more scary is because it's calcified, it'll show up on mammogram. But just know that fat necrosis is completely benign, very common. And if they give you information, they'll probably give you um, some sort of history of trauma, whether they you know, got in a car wreck and had the seatbelt really smashed against their, their breasts, what have you. So just look for a history of trauma, okay? Now let's talk about inflammation. Inflammation, very common. We call that mastitis after mammary gland inflammation itis, mastitis. So mastitis, one of the most common causes of mastitis is lactational mastitis. This is in breastfeeding mothers. Breastfeeding can cause cracked nipples and, and the staph aureus in a baby's mouth, which is a natural thing. It's not like they're infected with anything. It's just a natural bacteria in the mouth can go into those cracked nipples, cause really erythematous breast fever, basically give the mom a breast infection. So Staph aureus is the main bug. You get fever, you get an erythematous breast. And they might ask you how you would treat it. Well, you give, well, you give decloxacillin for the Staph aureus, and you also continue breastfeeding. All right, you want to clear it so there's nothing, so there's not gunk and more staph aureus being built up. You want to clear it and it's perfectly safe for the baby. Again, the staph aureus is from the baby originally, so it's not going to harm the baby and it'll help with the lactational mastitis, okay? So continue breastfeeding plus breastfeeding. Give them some antibiotics and this should be good. A complication of lactational mastitis that you should know is if you have the erythematous breast fever, However, when you feel it, you feel this little kind of mass that fluctuates, kind of like a fluid or a cystic mass, then you're worried that it might have progressed into an abscess and that will need to be drained, okay? So if you see a fluid mass, then you're thinking abscess. Another cause of breast inflammation is mammary duct ectasia. Now, ectasia means dilation. And this is characterized by dilation and clogging of ducts, especially the duct right underneath your areola. So we'll say peri areola. And because it clogs and is full of gunk, you can have a lump or a mass. It can be erythematous, but the key giveaway is a greenish discharge. Very, very classical finding. If they say that in a question stem, you're thinking of this. What causes that dilation? No one really knows for sure. It's seen more in a perimenopausal woman, so they think that age might be a, might be a factor. At, when you're older, a lot of your functional lobular glandular units get replaced just by fat, so it kind of goes away. And they think that that might predispose you to dilation and clogging. They think that vitamin A deficiency or smoking might, uh, smoking just because smoking damages everything is a toxin. Uh, vitamin A deficiency because these are very highly specialized cell layers and those specialized cell layers need uh, the vitamin A to 
differentiate basically. And if you're deficient in those, then you can have failure to differentiate. It stays as a squamous cell and it can cause keratin plugging, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll just write down vitamin A, deficiency and smoking, as well as old age. Those are all risk factors for mammary duct ectasia, but the big key giveaway is green discharge. Can you have this without green discharge? Sure, we just call that periductal mastitis. Just something, I guess, kind of like a branch of this. One last thing I wanna talk about is just gyno. Gyno is breast tissue. We talk about it in males. Do you remember where males have the most breast tissue? You said areola? correct. I really hope I'm pronouncing that right. Areola. <laughs> I have a feeling that I'm not, but it's too late now. It's too late to go back. So it's most commonly found in areola. It sounds so wrong. Uh, again, if a patient comes in complaining of gyno, the first place you check is going to be the areola. Just be just playing odds at that point. You need to know it's from increased estrogen because that's what causes breast tissue, or decreased test. And that balance is very important. Um, things that can cause this, it can be physiological. So times is when your hormones are really in flux. This is um, when, a ba when you're a baby, when the, when the boy is in puberty, or when you're elderly. That's when your hormones are kind of in flux and you can have physiological gyno, completely normal, just reassure them. A lot of questions I get from this is a teen, Boy will come in and say, Doc, I have this, this lump, this breast tissue. It's really bothering me. What should I do about it? And what you do about it is nothing. You just reassure him that it's normal and it'll go away on its own. Okay. Other causes of this, a little, other non-physiological causes of this are anything that increases estrogen. So client filters we talked about. When you see associations, don't just memorize them. So one of the rules of studying for a step is when you see associations, you take a minute, uh, a pause, to think about everything you know about that association. So when you see that Kleinfelters is associated with gyno, you take a pause and you tell me everything you know about Kleinfelters. Okay, so pause the video, think of everything you know about Kleinfelters, just start listing them off. And I hope you remember, because we just talked about Kleinfelters, all right? So back to the video, if you did in fact take that pause, I hope you did, because it's a, it's a mental lesson, it's more, I guess, a teaching lesson than anything. So Kleinfelter's is 47XXY, uh, defunct testes, uh, de decreased testosterone, increased estrogen, tall body, small testes, that is all Kleinfelter's. So that's what you have to do every time you see an association. And, and it takes a little bit of time the first time you do it, but the more you kind of have these in your mind, the more you can just spit them out really quickly, okay? Drugs can also cause these, especially drugs that are anti-androgens, like spironolactone, like cimetidine, which no one uses because why use cimetidine when you can use anything else? Um, keto, conazole, which is an antifungal. These are drugs associated with gyno. What did I just say whenever you see an association? List everything you know about that association. So, so just take take a second, pause the video, list the things you remember about these drugs. After you've listed those things, now see if you can synthesize it in a step-like question. How would they ask this? This is a case-bearing diuretic, isn't it? So they'll talk about someone that needs this diuretic, and then suddenly, or they might just say a patient is having heart failure and is taking a diuretic, they might not say this, and then develops gynecomastia. What were they taking? Then you kind of work backwards and say, oh, it's spironolactone. Or ketoconazole, because it's antifungal, someone has a fungal infection, is taking a drug, develops gynecomastia, what were they taking? Ketoconazole. So you need to work frontwards and backwards with these associations. If you can do that, then the step becomes really easy. That is just benign breast um, conditions. Now I want to talk about benign breast tumors. So something that's not really a breast tumor in the classical sense, but it's very common is fibrocystic change. Your breasts, again, respond to hormones and it fluctuates during your cycle. And constant fluctuation can cause, can cause overgrowth of tissue, 
that's the cystic part and fibrosis that's the that's the fibro part and when you have that and this is very very common if you ever do a breast examination on a gal over i don't know 30 40 they're gonna have it you just feel this lumpy irregular mass and you shouldn't freak out or they'll freak out it's completely normal so lumpy irregular mass that can because it is made out of breast tissue change during the cycle change in cycle or it can cause cyclic pain completely benign so just treat it symptomatically if need be however this constant fluctuation can can cause i guess compensatory changes from your body some changes are i guess benign some changes can predispose you to cancer so some of the more benign changes is apocrine metaplasia that basically cells turning into things that secrete more, I guess, just to, to compensate for the irritation or the fibrosis. That's benign. This is one of the few cases where metaplasia isn't clearly linked to an increased risk of cancer. However, another way it can compensate for this irritation, this fibrosis, is that it can undergo hyperplasia. Or the, the glandular parts of it can undergo hyperplasia. We call that adenosis. Whenever you have this proliferation, that's just a general principle, it's not good. It predisposes you to cancer. So fibrocystic change by itself isn't bad, but you have too much of it for too long, you can increase that risk for cancer depending on how it compensates for it. So we've been delaying the fact a little too much, let's actually talk about tumors proper. So actual benign tumors. One of the most common one is a fibroadenoma name gives it away. This is a cancer of breast and connective tissue. So breast plus connective tissue. And that fibrous connective tissue makes this firm, basically a marble. It is, it is literally, you feel like a marble, like you're feeling a marble, very sharp, well demarcated, mobile, round, marble essentially. And because it's made up of not only connective tissue, but breast tissue, it can, it can grow, it can cause cyclic pain. But this is a classical finding in fibroadenomas. Something very similar is phylloides tumor. And this is when you have a little bit more connective tissue than a fibroadenoma, and it can cause these little cauliflower-like projections. You don't really appreciate that on palpation, but if you see a, a histo image, which will be in my notes, you're going to see these really large cauliflower, very easy to identify, and that is a phylloides tumor. Last but not least is an intraductal papilloma. Again, the name gives it away. It's a papilloma inside your duct. So if this is your duct, it'll be something like this. And it can drain and cause bloody discharge. Very important. You know that that is a common common sign in the question stem and that's not always a dead giveaway because bloody discharge can raise concern for for cancer but the reason you know it's not cancer it still has its two layers of cells so you remember the two layers of cells that we talked about the luminal and the myoepithelial it'll still have that as opposed to if you see bloody discharge and you look histologically and it's lost those two layers then you're thinking more of cancer but if you see bloody discharge you see that little introductal little nugget in the duct and you still have those two layers of cells then you're thinking introductal papilloma you're thinking something benign that does it for this video hope you enjoyed see you next time